Well, um, this evening, of the title of our first round table is how to assess learning in a changing world. The pandemic has forced us to reevaluate everything that we do. Long-standing educational practices have been swept aside and the temporary abandonment of high stakes examinations on one side and the growth in online and hybrid teaching on the other. Despite widespread recognition of the need for change in assessment and examination around the world, there remain strikingly similar to those systems that prevailed more than a century ago. And that's according to Dr. Patricia Broadfoot. Recently, Jim Knight, uh, Lord Jim Knight, said that we have learned in the last 12 months that change is constant, exhausting and, accelerate, and accelerating. We have to educate for change. If that's the case, then we're asking in this forum, how do we assess learning in a constantly changing world? So to discuss this uh, this evening, we have our speakers. Firstly, uh, Devin Carberry uh, from Learn Life in Spain. Uh, he is the director of learning and the founding learning guide for Learn Life Barcelona. For the last 20 years, he has worked in different educational settings from after school to public policy and from classroom teaching to nonprofit leadership. Welcome to you, Devin. Uh, also, we have Angela Fares. She is the founder of Full Circle Education Consultancy. Angela experienced international, is an in, experienced international education expert who works with boards, governors, and school leaders to future-proof schools through innovative ed tech uh, curriculum and assessment design, as well as staff development. Also, we have Simon Walker. Simon is co-founder of Steer Education UK a pioneering UK edtech company which trains students to steer their cognition. Simon is an applied cognitive biologist. He taught at Oxford University and has advised UNESCO and the UK government. And finally also, Carol Allen. She is a teacher and SEN practitioner from the UK. Carol is an education advisor for ICT and inclusion and a teacher since 1980, both in mainstream schools as well as schools for students with learning difficulties. She was named as the top 10 educator for her work in inclusion at the EdTech uh, in 2018. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Now, uh, we are going to get started with uh, each panelist giving their three minute introduction. I've been told tonight to say no longer than three minutes for your introductions. So may we begin with the first speaker, who is Devin. All right, thanks, James. Um, can I share my screen? You may, for three minutes. Here we go. <laughs> I'm putting on my own clock here, three minutes. Um, so I wanna start by, by taking folks on, on the same journey we went on as an organization, where we did something which, uh, unfortunately is kind of novel because we asked the stakeholders what they think our assessment model should be like. So we actually spoke with the parents, we spoke with the learners, we brought in people from uh, who work in human resources, we brought in our thought leaders, we talked to different companies uh, who our, our kids might want to work for, and we asked them, what exactly are you looking for? And, and we, we started with this question you see here is, uh, learn life learners are dot 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 so they can thrive throughout their lifetime so what do you need and not just economically thrive but in all aspects of your life your your interpersonal relationships your well-being etc so i wonder if, if as i'm posing this if people wanted to put into the chat or the q a what would be your answer to this question what do you think uh whether it be for your own children whether it be for the learners you work for or even for yourself what do you need to to thrive in in 2030 in 2040 etc um I'll keep my eye on the chat as we go through that. Um, so we, we did this exercise and we came up with a number of different learner attributes. Um, one of which you have here is, is uh, lifelong learners. Everybody kind of came to unanimous agreement that we, we wanna cultivate lifelong learners. It's gonna be important across their lifetimes for people to continue to be able to learn. Um, and so then we said, okay, well, now that we know we want lifelong learners, what, what does that actually mean and so we then mapped that and developed our own curriculum and said okay based on this this is what we think are the kind of big ideas the skills the dispositions that one might need um and so we thought okay well we've got this um so how do how do we measure uh these attributes now that we know what we want to measure um 
So we had to come up with really creative ideas. But first, we, we came up with this credo, uh, similar to the Hippocratic Oath, of, of do no harm. Right. I think, unfortunately, uh, assessment gives too many learners uh, an unfortunate blow blast to their, their uh, self-esteem. And so we wanted to avoid that. Um, again, if people want to play along and make this interactive, I, my assessment to you on creativity at this moment is if you were a space alien and you saw this image, uh, what would you think was going on? Um, and would this, of course, uh, follow the do no harm credo? Um, so one of our other uh, learning, learner attributes was this, the, that we want them to be collaborative change makers. Um, and so we thought, okay, so how does one measure collaborative change making? And, and uh, I'd love to hear people's thoughts too in the chat of how do you measure if someone is actually a collaborative change maker? And so we went through this process with the learners, with, with, uh, with the whole uh, group that we had come together and, and decided on a variety of different ways. Um, I think I'll, I'll pause there. I have a number of other things I, I can talk about later about how we do, how we then report this. I can talk about the focus groups that we ran with learners and their interesting feedback about how they want to be assessed and those kind of things. But since I'm at my two minute and 55 second mark, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and pass the mic. David, thank you very much indeed. And now over to Angela. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, I was listening really interesting there um, uh, for Learn Life, and it's very similar to um, <clears throat> quite a few um, organisations I've been in schools from IB through to the, so I've been lucky enough to be in British and the American and the IB system. And I think for me, the main change has got to be away from a knowledge based assessment system um, to one that isn't focused on grades and rubrics. Um, and that is a change in mentality of parents as well. Um, I think I was listening to Sven talking and uh, about his his children's grades and my experience as a, as a leader is parents are obsessed with grades um, so we have to try and move away from them and and look at something different at um, what do we want our assessments to do so we want them to prepare our our students for the real world so they need to be focused on problem solving through application and through creativity through critical thinking and questioning through global mindset through an understanding of what the global problems are in the world right now and digital literacy, um, because we have to equip them with skills that they need within the assessment arena to be able to, to, to meet the challenges they'll, they'll face when they go out into the world. Um, again, going back to the previous discussion, um, having been in the British system, the American system, there's a big difference there because the American system is very much pre-test, post-test. Um, very summative, where you are at a point in time, whereas the British is more assessment for learning. So you're learning as you go. It's mini formative assessments, which is more of a, a, an approach to lifelong learning and an understanding that, like the 360 feedback, you can keep on learning, you can keep on growing. It's not an absolute. You've not failed. You can keep on learning. So assessment for learning, I think, is, is really important. Um, and assessment should be an ongoing reflective practice. It should be self-reflective, it should be peer-reflective, and it should be teacher-reflective. And within the assessment process, more of a project-based, uh, like the BTEC um, or like IB, where um, assessment is a collaborative effort and you can have an output however you decide. So if you would like to have your output creatively as a film, you can produce a movie. If you'd like to have a song, you can do a song. So these, I think, these, these types of assessments and approach to assessment will develop more innovative, self-confident, creative and agile um, learners who feel as if they have something to contribute and are happy to ask questions and happy to make mistakes. Um, and I think those are the type of people we need to have in an ever-changing world. Angela, thank you very much. And Simon, over to you. Thanks, James. Um, I'm hoping, has that shared my screen? Uh, yes, indeed, we can see your screen. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, it's great to be part of this um, conversation. Uh, fascinating to hear the end of Kevin and, uh, and also Devon and Angela, and that there are lots of sort of shared um, purposes, I think, you know, in, in, and, and perspectives that we hold at um, STEER Education. So um, at STEER, th this is how we describe our, our mission, to teach children to STEER, not just drive their minds fast. And underlying that statement is um, a piece of biology, a piece of science that we've done. So the, there's been a, um, a considerable body of work over the last sort of 30 years or so that's looked closely at how thinking happens and um, kind of defining the process of the, the of cognition that roughly drives um, what we mean by IQ 
and uh, sorry, that's um, what we mean by you know IQ, which is our ability to perform abstract, uh, complex computations fast and accurately. And and th th there's a in the original statement that James read out because we defined that about a century ago, um, and when worked out how we could measure it, we've carried on measuring it, and it's driven what schools basically do because it's it, it's measurable but we've all known that the brain does other things than that uh, it's just kind of fallen into this kind of bucket of of stuff that we don't have a commensurate singular um you know reliable objective measure for um and so we've done a lot of the science uh, around asking the question well, what is the brain doing with that other kind of bundle of stuff around you know learning to learn metacognition um those kinds of self-efficacy skills and we describe that in terms of steering, the, the, the mind's ability to steer. Uh, and steering cognitively is that ability to bias your attention and pay attention to a, a particular kind of data and um, use your cognitive resources appropriately. Just to, uh, to illustrate just for a second, just notice what your hands are doing right now. Notice what they're feeling like, what they're resting on. Uh, now, the interesting thing about that is that before I mentioned that, you weren't aware of your hands. Uh, and it's a really good illustration of the fact that um, the human brain's greatest ability is, is to actually ignore most of the data that it's it's receiving and to only pay attention to certain kinds of data. So um, that, that's really what underpins what we mean by cognitive bias, cognitive blindness. Um, and uh, we need to help, you know, education at one level is about helping um, young people to become aware of how they are, uh, you know, cognitively biased what they're paying attention to what they're not which is about access to learning but also social emotional skills as well because we navigate that road um so it's really the kind of cognitive science behind metacognition uh which we all know is such a massive accelerator um the good thing about steering is that it is measurable so that there is a way of reliably measuring it we've been able to demonstrate that just in terms of academic grades it contributes about 15 percent to academic outcomes certainly beyond school contributes uh, you know, a lot more to, to the soft skills in the workplace, you know, underpins not just access to learning, but mental health and social competencies, and it is trainable as well. So, you know, along with the other panelists and, you know, speakers, we're in the space of trying to quantify what's previously been kind of unquantified, but, but clearly very important in, in terms of educational priorities. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and I'd like to invite Carol for her views. Please go ahead, Carol. Super, I can't hear you, Carol. Are you have you unmuted? I have now. Oh, it's not you. often, it's not often I'm quiet. So that's <laughs> enjoy that little moment, folks. <laughs> right. Um, so I of course I needless to say, I feel like I'm coming in from a slightly different angle, but we're standing at a crossroads. We're standing at a crossroads looking at this lovely, lovely old signpost. We are right in the middle. We are where we are now. We have been through a period and we're not finished through a period of incredible educational change because of the, the COVID pandemic. And um, I'm pushing big time that if ever we are going to make substantial changes to our education systems and assessment, now is the time. We're never going to get in my working lifetime this opportunity again. So very simply, um, we can look back at where we were, but we're in the middle of the post and it's really time to go back to basics and say, well, where do we want to go to? Where do we want to be? And assessments um, need to change. Um, a lot of them are very fixed. If I take a measuring tape and measure 20 centimetres, it is always 20 centimetres. It doesn't alter. But if I take that spring, it can be 20 centimetres or I can extend it to make it longer. I can shove it together to make it shorter. And our assessment process, for, not in all cases, and I'll come back, needs to be more flexible. And particularly, you know that I'm, I, I um, my passion are the children who have got additional needs and so therefore I would argue that we have to have more flexible assessment for them. So assessment always, I come back to a practitioner if I'm working with a school, if I'm working with a company, what exactly do we want to find out? 
and the big one is why and for what purpose. And in the UK, sadly, and uh, I do a lot of work in the States and also America and also um, normally when I travel, and sadly, a lot of assessment is done to um, look at the effect in, in inverted commas effectiveness of the teachers in the schools rather than what the students are actually achieving or learning. You know, it's about validation of a system that actually doesn't work. So we need to have a think about that. But then we say, and we, you, a lot of you touched on this, are we assessing the whole person? Are we looking at the whole person or just one bit of the Trivial Pursuit cheese? Do we just want to know if they're good enough in the brown area or do we need to know the whole lot? And then, of course, my big thing is accessibility. We're not all the same. Our students are not all little Lego models that are all made the same. So sometimes there has to be a clear benchmark. So, for example, a driving test, that, that is an assessment. And we have to know that somebody reaches a certain standard in driving before we let them loose on the road. Uh, there are certain things which have to be like that, but not everything. And when we talk lifelong learning and when we talk cyclic understanding, then that is a different uh, notion. The, um, the keynote we had just before us talked about engagement. And of course, I'm a passionate believer that the special needs world, the inclusive world actually drives good practice. And those of you in the UK probably know, and, if, and others who don't, I can pass it to you. The Rochford Review for Children with Profound Multiple Learning Difficulties has given us a new engagement profile, a new way of looking at each individual student with complex needs, which makes incredible sense when you think about it, doesn't it? because um, a complex needs student will not, they're, they're not a homogenous group. And we finally have this freedom to do that. Now we can extrapolate a lot of that and take it up into mainstream. And in fact, a lot of it is there in early years work, but we seem to kind of hone it out as we go up. So what are we missing if we do these precision assessments? What are we, you know, this holistic view of somebody, um, for example, uh, the speaker just before me, I apologize, I've forgotten your name, talked about the, the ability of the brain to tune out other things. Well, I can tell you, if you've got ADHD or autism, you can't do that. So that doesn't work for a lot of those people. And we need to look at how we work with that. If we're doing an academic exam and you're dyslexic, it's about using the technology so you can show what you know rather than what you can read and you can write. It's So the whole thing comes together. And of course, you know, I can do this for hours, but I'm coming back to this where I started from. And I'm saying, you know, for heaven's sakes, if we don't change some of this now, we're just going to have a half cobbled change. We're going to have a system where more and more children are disenfranchised. And, um, you know, it's just wrong. This is our chance, guys. You know, and we should, all of the people who are here today, we should be getting together, putting our heads together and moving stuff forward. Thank you, Carol. Wonderful. And of course, with the signpost, if you don't know where you're going, anywhere will do, won't it? So I think that signpost is a really good um Example. Okay, so after these initial ideas, and I'm very grateful to our panelists for starting us off, we're now ready to start with the context of our conversation. Uh, and I'd like to do that um, with reference to this. In her iconoclastic book, Inadequate, Priella Carney says that curriculum design has been driven by assessment and that we teach what we can examine rather than what we believe needs to be taught. High stakes testing is not only detrimental to a child, but also close to useless for finding out how well children are learning. Angela, would you like to respond to, the, to this first point? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting Priya Lakhani saying that as she's, she's the um, advocate of AI in testing, um, which is very much standards-based and knowledge-based. Um, so I'm just quite interested to hear her saying that. Um, I think that, that we need to take a much broader um, approach to assessing children and, and whether, you know, whether Carol, whether we, we do assess and what, what, what does it look like? And, you know, assessment for me means that there should be, every child should feel successful. So every child should have the opportunity to shine. And I think that we are too preoccupied with standardized testing, with um, a route that everybody has to go down without having alternative options. I mean, I, 
interviewed a couple of weeks ago um, the CEO of one of the schools in Dubai and they have set up success routes from BTEC through to internships through to apprenticeships for every single child so every single child has the ability to succeed and and if you go back to what was mentioned in the previous um, session about John Hattie's research John Hattie actually said self-confidence is key but actually feedback is key so you know do we do we view feedback as assessment as well and what Sven was saying about 360 assessments absolutely you know 360 feedbacks and that ability for students to kind of keep on learning and keep on understanding how they can keep on improving because we're all learning every single day and it's not a fixed point in time so um i i i think that she's right i'm not sure that ai is the way forward to <laughs> to, to to make that happen um but um yeah I, I i think for me assessment is is about finding success for everyone and 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 then we're, we're good to go aren't we because everyone's self-confident they can achieve what they want to achieve and we have very confident capable people coming out into the world who feel that they can contribute. Angela, thank you very much. Simon, do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think to pick up on Angela's point, I, I think that's it's a really interesting and important idea that, that um, the, the ability of the, the, the learner themselves to formatively assess that their own journey um, is critical as, as a measure of both developing metacognition, but 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 also kind of auditing it. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I, I I think one of the problems of an AI-based kind of personalized curriculum is that it tends to undermine metacognition because the decisions are being made for you, rather than you actually learning to plot your own pathway and learn from your own mistakes. So that you know that that that's a, a question there. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not actually against, you know, putting pressure on on students and putting them in tough conditions where they have to perform to some kind of high level. Because actually, as an employer, um, you know, yeah. that's that's a lot of what it means to to operate in business. So I think we we mustn't assume that changing our assessment is about removing kind of pressurized, high performing contexts. But what those are may change. Thank you, Simon. Carol, over to you. What would you say? Well, I agree with with both of the people before. I think there's it, that, that there's a range of assessments. I, I think this is my my point. There's a range of things, and it always comes down to why are we doing the assessment? What do we need to know? Um, and I love the fact that Devon worked with the students and the um, parents. I love that. I obviously do. Any student who is able to um, use their own voice, and by that I mean either their own voice or maybe they can use assistive technology to speak to me. Um, a very simple thing I will say when I'm working with, with students who are struggling is, what's your best lesson and why is it good? What's your worst lesson and why is it good? And what can I do to make it easier for you? And I just ask those three things. And inevitably, I get really simple solutions that we can put into place straight away. You know, I mean, it's not some of it's not rocket science. And and like Angela said, then I've empowered that person. Like Devin said, that person has an ownership. They are self-assessing. And like Simon says, we're then giving them the tools so that, you know, if they are able and um wanting to take a high pressured you know uh, assessment test for something and it needs to be yes some of the things do need to be Simon um you know I don't want an airline pilot flying me when when I'm allowed to fly again who just fancy doing it and did a week's work experience I want somebody who's a brain surgeon I don't want somebody who's watched it on YouTube you know I do want the real deal so there are things where we need this pressured assessment but it is it's a wider view and I love that's what I particularly liked about the um, the keynote as it were about engagement and measuring engagement because there are kids who are fully engaged and and they deserve that credit for that and to help themselves forward. Thank you Carol. Over to you Devin would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I'll just share what, uh, in response to what Carol was saying about talking to the learners, I'll just share a little bit about what our learners said, because we, we had a bunch of focus groups with them. Um, and I, I love talking to them about it, because they're so they're so much better at understanding it, because they're the end users. They are the ones who know it best and what, what's going to work for them, what's not. And they said things like, uh, like uh, Simon was saying, that they actually want uh, time-sensitive challenges. They like this idea of time plus stress factors plus ridiculous goals. 
And so we, I'll go back to the second, to, we do a number of things, one of which is what we call transfer week, where the learners have to transfer their knowledge that they've been building over the last three months to some other thing that's not related at all to it. And so it's this intensive week where they design these crazy challenges for themselves. They work in transdisciplinary teams and, and they jump in and they said they love that, right? Um, so I agree, it's not that we take away the performance evaluations that have stress, but we make it consensual. That's, I think that's something that in the do no harm, let's, let's see, are you ready to, to do this? Because I mean, to take someone who is uh, going to be, to use Carol's example of a brain surgeon, maybe we don't get them to perform brain surgery until they say they're ready to perform <laughs> brain surgery. Um, some other things I thought was really cool is uh, what they said is about, um, that it's important to reflect upon what you learn versus what you wanted to learn um, to see how open you were to learning new unexpected things, right? Like that's, that's deep to get from a, I think it was a 13 year old that said that. Um, they recognize that self-assessment is often inaccurate. Right? I mean, for all of us, right? We have blind spots and we don't get it. So they, they suggested that learners find a uh, reference first to which they aspire, right? Someone who's at the professional level they wanna to get to and then compare their output to that completion, right? So that it's, or it could be someone who's just a, a, just a bar up, a friend or something, but they, they at least look at that and then they can do this kind of comparison. Um, they also said uh, that, you know, feedback is all about the process, right? They don't like it at the end. They don't wanna wait till the end. And they find value and we do a lot of pre-panels before they start a project. They have to pitch it to, oftentimes it's a parent, it's another learner, it's a learning guide. Um, and then they also have what we call track meetings uh, where they, they meet with a, a learning coach and, and they get to check in. And that, that's the stuff that they find the most valuable for assessment for learning rather than just of learning. Um, and I love that they said this is because I think people are rubric obsessed and they hate rubrics. Um, that they, they want to compare their work to other things that they've done or to the work of others. But this kind of rubric that just exists in a vacuum is just kind of this a personal checklist doesn't work for them, right? It doesn't feel like they, they, it doesn't drive them. It doesn't motivate them. And they don't think that it's, that's fair. Now, obviously they're to some degree, we're going to need some rubrics when it's, uh, you know, can you, can you surgery, can you perform surgery on the brain? There's some to do's there. There's the, the driving test, like Carol said, yeah, we probably check the boxes that you can do a U-turn. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, we don't always need those things. Devin, thank you. Can I just check with you? Did you say they were called pitch panels? Yeah. Right. Because we do, we do a lot of, uh, yeah. Uh, we have a 24 hour challenge, for example, where the learners have 24 hours to create a business from, from zero to pitching to a, a shark tank. Uh, and so they, we do a lot of that. They also do um, rites of passage where to switch to transition from program to program, uh, they need to identify something that they feel like is a blocker for them to meet the expectations of the next program. And so uh, rather than just kind of arbitrarily doing that, they have to pitch to a parent, right? To a learning guide, to um, another learner who really deeply know them to say, mm, are you really pushing yourself on this one? Is this really gonna unlock the growth that you're hoping for? And I think that's a really great assessment. And at the end, there's the post panel where they have to then go back and, and present what they did and did they actually meet their expectation? And what was their process like? Kevin, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Carol, um, as a teacher and a special needs uh, practitioner, would you agree that there's enormous pressure placed on schools to demonstrate that their students are on track uh, to make expected or higher progress? And this includes those with learning difficulties as well. Is this your experience? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it definitely is. And it's, this is one of my biggest problems with the current system is that it's a very narrow focus of, of success. Um, and, you know, some of my students uh, are, are never going to achieve certain levels. So why should they spend year in, year out striving for something that they're not going to be able to do and constantly be demoralized, constantly be told they haven't made the grade? I speak, I work with parents who come into annual review meetings and things and they're met by, um, oh, it's another year and he still can't do this and he still can't do this. And, and you know, that's soul destroying because you're, get, you're basically saying that that child's not making any progress, which is not true. They're just not making the progress in the things that, that, that is, are being assessed. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that the pandemic did um, highlight hugely is the ability of technology and um, students to be working out with the, the structure of the classroom to achieve levels that their, their educators didn't think they could. So if we take, for example, children with dyslexia, severe dyslexia, because they're at home, they could use all the tech to support them. 
Um, it wasn't disturbing their colleagues. They weren't embarrassed by using it, which are some of the reasons to get for not wanting to use it in class. Mm -hmm. And they suddenly found that they could do the work and, they, and, and loads of the students I've worked with and families, they don't want to go back to class now. You know, if I take children with ADHD, one one mother said, look, he cleared everything after the first month of I'm not doing that because that's schoolwork. I don't do school at home once they kind of got past that barrier. And he realized that he could do 20 minutes and then go out and shoot basketballs for 10 minutes and then have biscuits and then do some more. Well, you can't do that in a classroom and a school. You just can't. But what has he done? He's achieved all his, his assignments and he's got good grades. So, you know, the COVID, this pandemic has taught us so much about flexibility of approach. And it's just going to be such an awful shame if we don't learn from it. Yeah, thank you so much. I think what you say about the space that we learn in and assessing is so important. Thank you for sharing that. Angela, as a former head teacher of several international schools, do you envisage a return to business as usual in terms of summative assessment after the pandemic? Or do you think that there's a real appetite for change now? Well, I think I'd agree with Carol. I mean, my, when my school went online in, in Budapest, uh, um, it was transformational for some of the, the special needs boys particularly in year 10, year 11, um, they were just thriving. They were able to organise themselves, they were able to do creative writing they hadn't done before because they weren't worried about the spelling. So I think, uh, and also in terms of the impact it's had on teachers, you know, teachers who've never turned on their whiteboard <laughs> before um, were kind of forced into a situation where they, they had to innovate and they had to kind of take on the new technology. So I think it's really given a huge impetus, as Carol said, you know, this is the window of opportunity to make a change for positive, for creativity, for innovation, because everyone now is, I can do this, I can do this, and it actually it works. And those of us, even me, who had reservations and I'm now working with online schools, that online wasn't gonna work for all kids. Some kids really do thrive. And I think that we have to take that into account when we're planning for school strategies. And we have to take into account, should we have a hybrid learning environment? Should there be some opportunity for children who have you know, um, autistic spectrum um, disorders or if they have, they have real issues with bullying or social emotional well-being, should they be given the opportunity to have a blended learning environment? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's opened up lots of opportunities um, and uh, helped us see opportunities where we didn't see before. So really, we're kind of growing this pie. We're growing this innovation pie in education. Um, and it's had some really very, very positive effects. So for me, the learning loss was there. However, the skills that the children learn in terms of resilience and grit and determination and coping, and the same for the teachers, has really been very beneficial. Angela, thank you very much. Simon, your organisation curates one of the largest databases of adolescent cognitive, social and emotional development in the UK. What lessons can be taken forward, do you think, in designing more effective and holistic ways of assessing students? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Simon, I think. Sorry. Okay. Apologies. No um, I just wanted to pick up on the, 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 the impact of the pandemic and, you know, lockdown schooling, remote schooling um, in terms of our data. And um, there was a population of children who, uh, we, and we talk about schools as protective factors um, uh, or risk factors for whom um, homeschooling was a proved to be by contrast to because we, we measure the degree to which the school is a protectable risk factor. And we've tracked that for the last seven years across a population of 70,000 young people um, who remote schooling was a greater protective factor than on site schooling before the pandemic. So they did thrive better. And for some of those social emotional reasons that Andrew and, and Carol are talking about, not just those with neuro, um, you know, distinctive characteristics, but, um, you know, for some of the kind of um, paradigm breaking reasons that, that we're talking about, um, people being able to access technology and, um, so that was really encouraging. However, I, I would say that overall, um, the effect of the pandemic has been negative and it's been particularly negative on girls and particularly yeah. negative on um, higher adolescent girls between the age of 14 and 18. 
and that's a sheer fact. And um, the, 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 the headline around it is that um, well, both young people and girls in particular, but boys as well, have become more internalized, more autonomous, um, and less trusting of institutions. So as young people come back to school now, they're less trusting of the system and of adults to support them because ultimately, you know, the world has proved to be unsafe and unreliable and unpredictable. Um, so there's a lot of ground to be made up. Um, you know, in, in terms of therefore what we need to do to recover and uh, assess, well, you know, I, I would say that I think we need to continue to track the trajectory of, of young people's social emotional recovery and the characteristics of, of, of how we've shifted emotionally as a whole population um, through this experience. Um, it's never happened before in modern times. Um, you know, will it cause a long term shift in, in terms of what schools assess and where their priorities lie? Um, well, I think the two barriers to that are mainly higher education and inspectorates. Inspectorates, because if they carry on just, you know, looking at grades and, and, and whatever, and that sort of data makes it hard for schools to shift and devote resources to, to measuring something else. Um, uh, higher education, I think, is hugely culpable and hugely resistant to change because they have the whole business model on, you know, assessing and, and uh, you know, kind of forcing schools to to deliver against a certain narrow set of criteria. So, um, you know, I, I would like to see both of those parts of the system challenged. Uh, meanwhile, I think schools can be innovators in, in modeling something different. Simon, great, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for that. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, moving on. Carol, what, why is, I beg your pardon, um, yeah, in what ways would you suggest that we look at assessment for students with learning difficulties? Um, well, very, very simply, uh, if I would like a more holistic approach, but I recognise the difficulties in uh, large classes in mainstream schools to do that. But uh, that doesn't stop me from looking and, uh, and some of the schools I'm working with are putting in to uh, uh, we're trialing lots of different ways of doing that. Um, so so that works very well. I'm just going to throw in a little aside just in case any of you don't know this. This is a that now there's no major research on this. This is Carol Allen research. But um, the best time if you have to give a kind of a test an assessment of knowledge or skill do you know the best time in the school week to give it to to give it to your students it's tuesday morning at about half past nine ten o'clock uh, if you do if you do it on a monday even our best students our high flyers are transitioning from weekend back into school all right if you do it in the afternoons, a lot of the students, particularly if they've got additional needs, um, are kind of worn out. If you have a visual impairment, if you have a hearing impairment, the amount of energy they work out, you're using five times the energy in a, in, in a lesson to keep up with your able-bodied peers, with your non-sensory deprived peers, using five times the energy. So little wonder that after lunch, they're just about done and homework's a non-starter. Um, so afternoons go, and then we all know ourselves, Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon, you look at your timetable and you've got year six on a Thursday afternoon, you just think, oh my heavens, you know, because we're knackered on a Thursday afternoon. So that's not an ideal test time, best time. Earliest in the term, two or three weeks in, Tuesday morning. So you asked me about the assessment. I'd like it more holistic. I'd like, I'm very interested in looking at how the engagement profile can be applied to mainstream. And I am absolutely passionate about following up from COVID and making sure that the students who have got uh, abilities and disabilities where technology can give them access to the mainstream exams that we ensure that every single one of those students not only has them, knows how to use them themselves without an adult sitting next to them and can advocate for them and that it is an ongoing flexible process because technology is improving so fast. We can't say, oh, we've done an assessment, you get that and that's it for the rest of your school career because something better might come along in six months time and we need to move the children on. So those would be my three features. That's brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Carol. Uh, Devin, your organisation put together the ReLearn Innovation Festival in 2020, including the festival topic specifically on assessment and what might replace exams. 
So I wondered if you could share any of the outcomes from that or your thinking since the festival. Yeah, um, happily. I, I think um, what's come out of it is, is that there, there seems to just be, I mean, this conversation that we're having now, there seems to be unanimity that we just need to change. Can we just please change already? It's, it's, I mean, obviously it's preaching to the choir at these events when people come and see, but I think there's a resounding um, cry for change. And as Simon pointed out, uh, uh, universities to some degree are, are culpable for this because at the other end, when they leave university, the business side is, uh, is, is, is upset. <laughs> They're upset that the, the learners are coming out and they have no data that helps them at all understand who they should hire. Um, and so it's been great to, to bring those worlds together. And so that, that's what we've been trying to do is to, to, to talk with people uh, at the other end, where whatever the next step is for the learners, um, uh, whether that be uh, recruiters or companies or things like that, and ask, well, what would you really need to know about the learners? And so I think that's the, it put us on that journey to, to start digging in there. Um, and actually, I would like to share with you just a couple of things that came out of this because we've been, we've been, as an innovation lab, we, we get this kind of feedback. And so we thought, what can we do um, to really align ourselves? And so we, we have kind of real challenges. You see up here in the top right, a woman who in our showcase um, is, has made an entire fashion line and actually has to demonstrate this fashion line, right? That's something that uh, you show in a professional portfolio and business is like, oh, what kind of competencies had to go into being able to do this, to pitch this and to actually sell your fashion line? Uh, we have a learner who, uh, we have digital portfolios now where you see this learner has actually designed a 3D print uh, product and is selling it on his website. Um, we have uh, any variety of things. We have hackathons where we, we recently had um, uh, participated in Autodesk challenge where they had to, the learners had to, using a 3D printer, 3D print a device that would support someone with a physical disability. And in this case, our learners were given someone who didn't have access to the use of their hands. And so they had to interview this person, go through the design thinking process and create a product for that person that would help them open water bottles, which they did successfully. And then they shipped to the person, they were able to use it and have proof of concept. This was done in like four days with a group of 13 and 14 year olds using a 3D printer. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're hearing are the evidence that people actually want to see as proof of, of learning, not of that they can put fill in a multiple choice exam or regurgitate information because we're seeing the, the global cost of onboarding employees and training them up as, as entry level employees is, is, is staggering, right? And so we, we, we're hearing this from all kinds of, of, of places. Um, a couple of other things that we're, we're realizing, actually, I'll, I'll stop there with the, the examples, but we have lots of different ways and we're, we're continuing to innovate. And I think it's, for us, it's, we, do, we don't pretend that we have the answer, but um, we, we would like to actually I take it back. I want to show you one more thing, one more thing um, here, because um, we have uh, also, how do we present what learners are learning, right? So we, we need to have reports that reflect this. And this is, the, this is an old version of, of what we've, we've changed to be more, um, more updated. Um, but having a quick at a glance thing that's based on what your community says are the most important things for learners to learn to having access to a digital portfolio that you can see here to, um, to having different kind of key milestones. What are the capstone experiences they've gone through with the rites of passage um, so that uh, we can replace the traditional transcripts that make us beholden to grades that are so reductionist and don't give an accurate portrait. And it's, it's baffling to me too that universities aren't upset with that because if that's all you can see is their grades, is that really telling you what that kind of learner is going to bring to your university? The kind of learners that are, are going to go out and represent you in the world? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Devin, thanks very much. Angela, um, your work at Stanford American International School in Singapore included a significant contribution to the IB Primary Years Program, PYP. And do you think that mainstream education and this context of the discussion we're having at the moment could benefit from a similar approach? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really similar. De Devin's model is very close to uh, aligned to the IB, um, so the primary years and the middle years program, which is about um, a holistic um, assessment of children. So you have a learner profile and you assess them in, in every unit about whether they're a risk taker, whether they're a collaborator, a communicator, and you give them a chance to, to show the different attributes and learner attributes in, in, in different units of study. And you don't have grades so much, but you have, everything has to have a global context. So you're looking at really developing students who um, place a very high emphasis on social value and purpose, um, and that you are um, harnessing creativity because they're allowed to have output however they want. And e-portfolios, I saw Devon had there, are very, very important. Because of course, if you're in an international school, the children are going everywhere and they need to take their portfolios with them. So an e-portfolio, the children at the end of each unit would do a little reflection on what they thought they'd done and 
bearing in mind everything that's the, the self reflection can't always be um, something that's um, that valuable, particularly a seven year old. But I think the difference again is that is the role of the teacher. So the role of a teacher in an IB or, a, or, or a, an approach such as Devon's is that you are a co-creator, you are a facilitator, you are, um, you can be a leader, but you can also be a learner. So it's very much a building of a community. And I think this building of a community builds trust and it builds confidence because you don't feel as a child or a student that you're going to be seen as giving a wrong answer. Um, so you're developing your understanding of the world within a framework. So it's not just you just don't go off and do what you like. You have a you, you agree a, a central statement you're going to look into an inquiry. And there's a we used to follow the Kath Murdoch inquiry model. So we had a, a model that everyone followed. So they knew where they were going. But these kinds of inquiry model skills, as Devin showing you at Learn Life, are really developing those critical thinking, collaboration, creativity. Um, an understanding of global context and what's going on in the world and real world issues. So everything is always contextualized with problems that we have in the real world. And um, we can all find anything we want on Google. We can find as much knowledge as we want on Google, but we need to find solutions to real world problems. And it's only by introducing those into the framework of your curriculum that you're going to find those and children and students are gonna start talking about them. So absolutely, I think every school should be following a similar project-based model as Devin's or I because it's the only way we're going to move away from standardized grading that's standardized assessments and for goodness sake let's use technology for assessments the IB MYP downloads all of your assessment onto a laptop you have a video in your science lab you, you can just type it in so all of those children with special needs who can't handwrite who can't spell it doesn't matter and they can have as much time as they want and they can actually come back to the exam and do it later if they run out of time. So it's it's a real world situation where you're collaborating and you're really coming up with solutions to, to challenges and, and it's real. I think real world ready is really important for, for all of our kids. Angela, thank you so much. Here, here. Um, now we've run a bit short on time, so I'm gonna move um, to the last part um, before we come to the questions from our audience. I'd like to ask each of you for one idea, one sentence, uh, on what each of us could do tomorrow that would help our school or institution to improve assessment. What do you think, Devin, to start with you? One sentence. Co-create, work with the different stakeholders, do it together, stop, get out of the ivory tower, come down and talk to the people who, who are gonna be impacted by this. Sorry, that was a variety of short sentences, but I think they added up to a, a compound complex sentence. Yeah. Angela. I would get rid of high stakes, PISA rankings, government rankings, everything that makes teachers nervous, parents nervous and children nervous. Fantastic, thank you. Simon. Um, I, I think I'd try to frame a different conversation within the school and within parents and, and, and say, you know, we've done a really great job of teaching children to drive their minds fast, but um, what about teaching them to steer? And literally throw that out there as a, as a question, you know, how interested would you be um, if, if our school really focused on teaching and, and then measuring how children are developing that ability to steer? Thank you very much indeed, Simon. And Carol? Oh, unmute. Sorry, um, learn how to listen. And that sounds incredibly simple, but in fact, uh, education and teachers are very, very bad at listening. Um, they think they're listening, but they're listening for what they want to hear. They've usually got something, a preconceived idea of what they want that child to be saying or answering. If the child comes in with something from left field, uh, it sometimes throws them. So, and learn to listen to the whole child. The words they're saying are only part of the picture. Look at their body language, the tone, the expression, the pauses, the hesitancy. Um, you learning how to listen and doing this with your staff is one of the strongest ways of uh, increasing impact in your classrooms, in your teaching, and that's at any level, FE, HE, everything. If you teach your staff and remind them, because they probably know, but skill them up again in learning how to listen. That's the one, that's the one that will make the biggest change. Carol, brilliant, all said in one breath, marvellous. 
Thank you very much uh, to the panelists for sharing your ideas and points. Um, we're going to go over now to Sven. He's going to um, come back with some of the questions and answers. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your for your insights. Um, I think there's so much common sense here in the room. Um, and the question is why things are not happening in the real world. Mm -hmm. So who are the polit politicians we have to, I don't know, to convince that, that things are really happening in, in a different way. We have a, a couple of questions. One is about uh, formative and summative assessment. So uh, uh, Catherine is asking, can you speak on using the same assessment for formative and summative data? Who wants to take this up? Um, yeah, I'll pick that one up. Um, I, I mean, formative assessment is you're assessing um, for learning. So it's helping you progress their learning over a period of time. Right. So you'll do a mini assessment and see how they're doing, a bit like the, the, the 360s, Ben, you were talking about. And then you give them some pointers and they keep on developing. The summative assessment is a point in time. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily um it, it's it's at the end of a period of learning whereas formative is during that learning so you you might use a mini summative as a formative during um a period of time but um and you could say that your summative is a a long list of formatives that you've done along the way um but i would i would say probably not because the formative should be individualized and it should be really for the for the individual child and the summative you, you would give as as a whole class should we get rid of the summative anyway uh, at the end of it i would personally or i think you you, you give some creative output so yeah. you say, show your understanding Give me what you understand from this unit and do it however you like. But the most important thing is you have to communicate it effectively and you have to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask you questions and you answer questions on it because then you're, you're really testing understanding. So that's just my personal opinion. Maybe following up on this a little bit, at, at the end of the day, what are you, what are you talking, right? Um, the formative is, is uh, you also mentioned it, uh, you either can look at assessment as a process, right? As you go or, or as an event at the end. So can you share maybe a couple of more examples of schools who are doing a really good job in, in, in understanding assessment as a process to, to help children to, to develop based on the feedback they are getting? Um, I Devin, I'm sure, would have some really good examples from his school, but from, from my schools, the, the, the best examples were the IB schools that I worked in, because it was a continual collaborative environment, a dialogic classroom, where children were sharing feedback all the time, and, the, and essentially the teachers going around spinning plates, and just seeing where everybody's at. So that that is... Um, that is not constrained by rubrics. It's not driven by an end assessment that you have to teach towards. Um, you know, you don't have a pre-test that then you have to post-test to show the parents and and the leaders of the school how everyone's made progress. But it's purely for the learning experience for each individual child. And Devin, I'm sure you must have some very good examples as well. And this is this is how your your whole um, yeah, the, I mean school operates. I think when assessment is something that's not done to you, but done with you, formative and summative assessment are very desirable. Um, we want feedback along the journey, and then we want to get recognized at the end for the, the cool thing that we've produced. Um, we have a, a learner, for example, who has just taken a pair of, of glasses, and he's into electronics, and so he's designed a motion sensor uh, I'm sorry, it's a distance sensor here that plugs into earphones for blind people so that they can, the sensor captures in 360 degrees, uh, what's it, or no, it must not be 360, it's a 180, what's in front of him, and it gives you beeping sounds to let you know how close things are. Or like throughout the process, he needed a lot of feedback on it. Is this working? Is it not working? He had to trial and, and test. And at the end, of course, you want to get recognized, but by who? Because they're tired of us as the learning guides giving them recognition. They want their friends to see it. They want their family. They want to project cast that out into the world. So I think we also need to think about to with this generation, like what is the way that they want to, to be recognized? Uh, a lot of our learners, when we've talked to them about it, they're like, yeah, we would love to use Instagram as our, our space where we get feedback or we get to post and we get to, because it's, it's really important for them, not just getting feedback, but from whom do you get feedback, right? And so they want to be in communities of interest and they divided it too, which 
I thought was really interesting. They said, I want just the like the likes, just so I can see how cool I am. But I also then want the the actual real feedback from someone who's an expert in the field or who gets me and who really sees what I'm trying to do and can push me to the next level. And so um, I think it's so easy to do if you don't try to do it to someone because they will resist, they will feel bad about themselves. But when you ask, what would be the best checkpoints along the way? What kind of feedback do you want? And what would you like the final output to be? It's not that challenging. Yeah. Thank you very much, Devin. Uh, thanks, Angela, Carol, Simon, for, for your time, for sharing uh, your experience. Uh, very much appreciated. And yeah, hopefully we can connect uh, sometimes in the future. <laughs>